Welcome back, everyone, to another week of Encounter with God uh, Together. We are following the notes, and this week we're going to be bridging uh, two quarters worth of notes in the book of Revelation, so you'll need both your issues handy. And I'm so pleased to have back Colin Sinclair, who is a minister in the Church of Scotland in Edinburgh and uh, recently finished out as moderator of the uh, Church of Scotland. He has served with Scripture Union for most of his life in a number of roles and uh, likes to consider himself a, a troublemaker. So Colin, good to have you back. I, I don't know what kind of trouble you're gonna start today, but uh, good trouble. Well, Gail, it's lovely to be with you. And if you can see this, I got my encounter with God mug and- uh, Oh, so glad that made its way to you. Yeah, I, I have to say the mugs are much bigger in America than they are in Britain, but it gives me a real good pint of tea to drink, which is great. <laughs> Actually, those are those are big for us too. Um, so consequently, I usually reach for it because I like a big big mug of coffee too. Yes. So um, yeah, and if you'd like to get one of those mugs, they are available in our online store. So if you want to join us with your mug of coffee in the morning, feel free to go over there and and get yourself one. It is a nice uh, a nice giant size. Um, so Colin, last week you uh, you took us through your first um, writings in the book of Revelation. Co Colin is actually the author of the notes these three weeks in Revelation. So we're extra blessed to have him with us. And uh, for those of you who did not get a chance to see that, I highly recommend you, uh, you check it out. It was a really uh, lively session and uh, gave a lot of visuals to think about. So I'm looking forward to this week, and um, I'm just going to pray and let you um, dig in. Father, I thank you that we have Colin here, that he is um, equipped to share your word and to study and to uh, hear from your spirit, and that he brings um, life to this book of Revelation and added insights. And I pray that you give him words by your spirit today to share with us. I thank you for his many years of ministry. Um, in so many different locations. And I pray you bless them today and bless us as we listen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right. Okay. Well, it's lovely to be back with you again. again. And um, we're going to explore together uh, this coming week's readings, which is Revelation 14 to 18. Perhaps just to say by way of introduction, it's probably for most of us an unfamiliar part of the Bible. Don't panic. And uh, <laughs> it's also quite a difficult part. And some of it's quite hard. And I yeah. think um, just try and find some points you can land on. Um, it, it, I, I've gone back to these notes, which, which were written a while ago, and uh, have, have been trying to, to make it come alive again. So what I've decided to do uh, in this session is just to pick out three of the key themes in this week and maybe just say a wee bit about them, which hopefully will make the whole passage come alive. And as you read your Bible and read the note, maybe that you'll get something helpful for it. I said last week, and I'll say again, that um, in one way, the way I approach Revelation may be slightly different to what you're used to. Don't worry about that because there's enough common ground that uh, however you've been taught to approach it, I think there are lessons about uh, worshiping God, serving Christ, and being faithful to the gospel that are true, however otherwise you try and understand this book. And what I've decided to do is just to look at three of the themes that will come out this week, the theme of witness, the theme of judgment, and the story of Babylon. And we'll see if that can help you in your week's exploration. So let's start with the first one, which is it's really highlighted in chapter 14. Um, we, we left last week, you may remember this, this terrifying picture that the dragon, Satan, had <laughs> begun to bring out his allies. There was the, the beast of the earth, which was the political force and dominance um, of, of the totalitarian state. There was the beast of the sea, which was, if you like, the, the priest, the PR agent who was trying to get you to think that there's nothing better than the beast of the earth. And mm. against that, those who are calling for us to simply bow the knee and say, Caesar is Lord. There were the people of God who said, no, Jesus is Lord. Mm. And uh, the, the cost of being faithful to Christ sometimes is quite high. But there's nothing in this passage that encourages us to take up arms or follow an opposition political party. What it does call us is to be willing to recognize that if we follow in the steps of the crucified one, mm. then suffering may be part of the cost of our witness, but may actually be the thing that makes our witness get through to someone else. 
And for some who follow Christ, even to today, all around the world, it could mean loss of employment, it could mean imprisonment, it could mean martyrdom. Mm. And uh, in one sense, I, I've suggested that the way I look at Revelation is to see the same period from the first coming to the second coming covered in, in different ways. And in and each cycle, each spiral becomes more intense and we're coming towards the climax. And chapter 14, in a sense, rounds off the story that we looked at last week in chapters 12 and 13. And here is, here is the good news that after the chaos of the devil and the beast of the earth and the beast of the peace, we come to the security of Mount Zion, where the mm. lamb is. What a contrast. Um, we're away from persecution and threat. We're in a place where God's will will be done. And from the incompleteness of the 666, the mark of the beast, we come to another figurative number, the 144,000. We saw this earlier in Revelation yeah. chapter 7, where it went straight away from saying 144,000 to the next verse saying there was a crowd that no one could number. So <laughs> that gives me the suggestion that 144,000 is not saying there's only going to be 144,000 people in heaven. We'd all be in trouble then. But rather saying that this is a, a picture of, of completeness. And here, God's will will be done. Whatever power and authority evil has, God will watch over his own. And here were people who had completed the course. No wonder they're singing. There's an orchestra. Um, <laughs> uh, harp. harp is playing the thing. It, it's so much to do because here are people who are those who have been redeemed, faithful to Christ, who followed the Lamb and were men and women of integrity. And so we're called to witness. And then, um, in a sense, against that, we see that there is now a clear division. Are you going to have the mark of the lamb or the mark of the beast? For those who follow Christ, there will be people from every tribe and, and language and people. Um, and they may look as though they are the weak and the defeated. But in the end, because they are Christ, they are the victorious and, and, and they make it home. And, uh, and now they can rest from their service and rest from their witness and their deeds will follow them. Mm. So moving from witness, we move on to a subject which um, Isaiah rightly calls God's strange work hmm. and that's the work of judgment. And I have to say, it's not something I ever like talking about, nor I think we ever should like talking about it, but we still have to talk about it. Yeah. One of the great yeah. One of the great Scottish preachers said, never preach in judgment unless you can only do it with tears in your eyes. Because mm. in the end of the day, we're talking about people with names and stories and, and history. I find it fascinating that some of the hardest words in the whole Bible um, are reserved for the lips of Jesus himself, as if to say it is only love that can speak about these difficult things. Oh, I really like that. I really like that. That's helpful to me. Yeah, but it is, of course, the other side of salvation. There's no point in being saved unless there's something you're saved from. And so salvation and judgment, if you like, are the two sides of the one coin. And in the Old Testament, the great miracle which shaped the children of Israel was, of course, the Exodus event. The children of Israel who are rescued from slavery and oppression and taken to the promised land. But... It was at the cost of judgment on Egypt in the Passover right. and then the drowning of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. So their salvation, which produced Miriam's great song, was also the judgment on a nation who had condoned oppression, slavery, and even attempted ethnic cleansing by the midwives. And uh, and here is a, is a very... Um, powerful picture of judgment that comes at the end of chapter 14 and it's a picture of not not the harvest um, which is about salvation the, the wheat separated from the chaff but about the grape harvest and i don't know whether in america you sing that great song to the yeah, back I that the up here, yeah. but, but actually you know we, we all belt it out and it's a great hymn but my eyes have seen the glory of the coming lord it, it, it's actually a hymn of judgment yeah trampling out the vintage and we should sing it yeah it it, it moves us yeah. but it's actually very sobering it is yeah um, i you know i noticed that in your note and uh it, it put a whole new spin to me because i sing it but hadn't really 
you know, quite connected the dots there. And uh, so I'll, I'll think of it in a whole new way next time. Yeah. It, I think we have to recognize too that there is something, however much we, we, we run from judgment, there is something that we want God to be judge and to be just. Uh, the great cry of all children, certainly in Scotland, it's not fair. Yeah. Is that we want there to be a sorting out of the unfairness. And yeah. way back in, in chapter six of Revelation, um, there is a cry uh, in one of the earlier warning judgments. How long? How long? Mm. And, and one of the Psalms has, has a whole series of how longs in Psalm 13. And, and sometimes when you see people who are sick, yeah. or perhaps a refugee, or facing doubt, or defeat, or bereavement, the cry is, how long? Mm. And, and now we come to the point where this is the last how long, because judgment is coming, and people who are hurt want relief, and people who are bullied want fairness, and people who are pushed around, they want dignity. And so we pray, your kingdom come, because we want the king of all the earth to do right and to bring righteousness in. So although it's a fearful theme and yeah. a frightening theme, yet there is something that in our worship which says the Lord is king and we want him to be king. And in our prayers we say, Lord, deliver us from evil. And God's word teaches us that we want right to triumph over wrong. And what we have to remember is that God doesn't play wolf, wolf. I don't know if you know the story where the wee boy cries wolf, wolf, and he's just yeah. kidding. Well, God doesn't talk about a judgment just to, to get us nervous. He says, there mm -hmm. is a day. And I tell you now, so as you'll get ready before that day, because I want to love you and embrace you, and I want grace to fill your life. So because there is judgment, now is the time for repentance and grace and salvation. So you're not caught by surprise. You're not caught in up. That's why we go and do mission. We want to say, here is good news before there is bad news. Right. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and that comes through in this chapter here. It's mm. interesting. That we, we come in the section, uh, Gail, to the, the third series of, of seven. We have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. And the seven seals are kind of stuff happens. Bad stuff happens, and it shakes us up. Now is the chance to get ready. The seven trumpets are like, like warning signs saying, come on, take this seriously. And the seven bowls say, well, now it's too late. You know, this is, this is the judgment. You've had your chance and, uh, and that's frightening. But perhaps I ought to say that I don't think the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls are consecutive chronologically. And the way I've been interpreting it, I mean, it'd be interesting to know what you felt about COVID-19 happens there have always been plagues that we've lost sight of the of reality or is it in fact you know our judgment and, and everyone will have their own and uh, the interesting thing is here and i i only really discovered this when i started to write the notes that the the big confrontation between good and evil happens in this place called armageddon uh, you know mm. and, and Sometimes we think of Armageddon or we think of Gog and Magog and, and, and we know the geographical area near Nazareth, the great crossroads, and we have this picture of the armies of evil and the armies of good. But when you read the passage, there never is a battle. There never is a conflict because, in fact, the battle was won on the cross. And uh, all that happens is that evil is dealt with and dealt with in reverse and um, uh, the beast of the earth and the beast of the sea are dealt with first. Well, Babylon's dealt with first, then the beast of the sea, then the beast of the earth, and finally the dragon itself, because God will not allow sin and evil to spoil the goodness of God. And, mm. uh, and that's a real challenge. Which leads me on to my last theme, just a word or two then uh, about Babylon, chapter 17 and 18. And we're going to contrast uh, Babylon in 17 and 18 with the New Jerusalem in 21 and 22. Um, but, but Babylon is, is a picture of, of, of the godless civilization. Mm. Um, in a sense, we all face three challenges to face. Sometimes it's, it's physical persecution. Sometimes it's mental false teaching. That's the beast of the earth and the beast of the sea. Or sometimes it's moral compromise, mm. where just the culture around us makes us think differently, act differently, lose sight of the high calling to follow Jesus. 
And that's Babylon. Babylon, the great prostitute who entices you into its way of doing things and leaves you short of following the highway of, of Jesus Christ. And uh, yes, we know the story of Babylon from Genesis. Babylon here was probably a code word for Rome, too dangerous to put into actual words. But Babylon is all godless civilization down through the years that have become, in Bunyan's phrase, the vanity fair um, mm. for the Christian, that the, the bright lights, the gaudy values, this is the way to do it. And we end up losing sight of the service, loving, caring spirit of, of, of Jesus Christ. And what mm. a picture. Here's this uh, the scarlet woman. Um, that's a good theme for sermon, scarlet woman. I'm glad you're not wearing red today. <laughs> Me too. Sitting <laughs> yeah. on the beast. Um, and uh, the beast is covered with blasphemous names. And uh, the, the woman is holding a cup filled with immorality and on the title, Babylon the Great, the mother of <laughs> prostitutes. And, and what strikes you is, is, her, is her arrogance and her flashy appearance and her hatred of God's people and her commitment to the beast and also her destined fate. And of course, it could have been that when John was writing it, he was partly thinking of people like Messaline, Claudius's immoral wife, um, who, who was renowned for, for her uh, way of behaving. But we could also see it as all those who say, take your eyes off Christ. This is the way to get wealth and popularity. It offers materialism without morality and pleasure without purity and, and wealth without wisdom. Uh, it, it, is, it is the secular world of, of the empires down through the age to our current day. It is, um, uh, it is a society that works by seduction and hypnosis and artificial glamour. And of course, there are always those who, who want um, Babylon to continue. You know, the, the traders and businessmen who make their money off it, the transport firms who, who rely on it, uh, the consumers who want the newest thing, the celebrities who are flaunting it. But in the end, it's all an empty shell. And in the end, in chapters 17 and 18, you see the narrative of its destruction and then the song of its destruction. Mm. And in the end, it falls. Now, Rome itself, of course, didn't fall till the fifth century, but it speaks in the prophetic future saying, a society that stands on nothing will eventually fall. It's, um, for all its vaunted power, it will not last. And so here in another way, he's, he's giving the picture. Have you the mark of the beast or the mark of the lamb? Are you traveling to Jerusalem or are you living for Babylon? And uh, in that, in these three things, the call for witness and judgment in Babylon, he's preparing us for the end of all things mm. and the hope for everything. Mm. That's well, something of which we'll look at this week. You covered a lot, a lot of ground there, and I, I appreciate the, the themes that you, you wrap that under. I think that gives us a good, a good outline for, for reading this week, a, a good lens to look through. So... Um, well, Colin, I wonder if you would just pray for us as we... Uh... Sure. I'll do that gladly. Let's pray. Father, we're not used to thinking with such strong and powerful images, some of which are quite frightening and disturbing. Mm. And yet we thank you that through them all, um, and even against the background of judgment, there is the offer of grace. Mm. And through the destruction and the deception, there is a certainty that your people will be protected and brought safe home. And there they can join in worship and praise to our God. Help us where we are to faithfully be the pilgrim people of God, journeying towards the promised city whose maker and builder is God. Mm. So we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Colin. And uh, if you don't have next quarter's uh, prayer guide, if for some reason that did not make its way to you, uh, or you've never had it, you can go on our site or contact our office, and we'll make sure that you're able to get a copy so you can follow along with the notes that um, that Colin's been sharing from. Colin, we get one more week of you, and uh, I'm looking forward to that too. So. Oh, yeah. um, Take care this week and we will we will talk with you again soon.
And thank you for letting me meet with your 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 encounter with God, Peter. It's been lovely to be with you. Yes, thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone.